over the years, you've heard me say this over and over again, that when our focus is not on Christ, it is hard to see the grace that surrounds us. Here's the thing. Sometimes what is right in front of us can keep us from seeing that grace, let alone Jesus. See, it's hard to focus over here when something over here has our full attention. According to Scripture, Adam and Eve were surrounded by God's grace. It was everywhere they looked, everywhere they went. However, they could not see it. Not because they were blind, but because what kept drawing their focus away from the grace they had was the one thing they were told they could not have. Fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're no different today. Tell someone not to do something, and chances are they're going to go right out and do it. No matter what dire consequences we proclaim. Why? Some say curiosity. Others say arrogance. Whatever the reason, the forbidden fruits of life draw our attention away from where it should be and tempt us to sample what they offer. All under the auspice that what they have to offer is somehow better than what we already have. Of course, we don't realize the fallacy of this line of thinking until one is given in to those temptations and like Adam and Eve had their lives changed forever. We all know the story. One day, Adam and Eve are walking through the garden, and they find themselves, as some commentaries say, once again, standing before that which God had told them they could not have. I imagine they visited that tree quite often, just as we might, to see that which supposedly has the power to take away life. And my guess is it was a really attractive tree with lots of beautiful flowers giving away to a wonderful, colorful fruit. Because if it wasn't, it sure would have been a lot easier to ignore. They probably sat and watched the animals of the garden scamper across its branches and some possibly even eating the fruit. And they waited. They waited to see if the tree really had the power of death. And seeing life continue, I suspect, each time they visited a tree, they would inch a little bit closer, and a little bit closer, until they had the courage to touch it, and examine it. What fear they had was replaced by a very human trait that we know, the curiosity of what hidden treasure lies beyond that which keeps us then from seeing it and having it. This growing curiosity makes them very susceptible to the serpent's encouragement. Encouragement to try that fruit they had seen maybe the animals eat without consequence. But the consequences weren't made for the animals for them. Because God knew that once they possessed this knowledge, innocence would be lost. And relationships would be changed forever. And we see God is right. After Adam and Eve eat that fruit, they realize their nakedness. And they fear God in a way they had never feared God before. Trust broken takes time to heal, even longer to be restored. Even if one party is more willing than the other to see things as they once were. The sad part about this is that in many cases, 
because of our humanity. There are times when trust between parties may never exist again. Once divided, even where there was once a healthy trust, the strength each party gained from the other is lost. Forever, maybe. And such divisions is what I think Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. He made reference to the house of Beelzebub, but his metaphor fits every household, every relationship. Where trust that binds together the parties involved is broken, unity and harmony no longer exist. And when confronted with such situations, we typically respond in one of two ways. We either walk away from it, advocating our own self-righteousness, or we try to fix it. We try to rebuild it. You see, when we walk away, we typically do so, placing all the blame on the other, without ever learning what may have been done to avoid it. All we see is our hurt. And because of this, we may never know the how or why of whatever it was that broke our trust in the first place. But if we try to rebuild it, and while we might fail, we still might learn something about ourselves that when trust is restored or ultimately set aside, can still make us stronger and wiser. Still, as we have all experienced in life, there are just some trusts, once broken, are almost impossible to rebuild, especially those that risk someone's health or safety. Quite frankly, those, maybe, never should be restored. But Jesus, Jesus talks about an unforgivable sin. The sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Denying God's grace in our midst. And attributing all the evil in the world to the one who is nothing but all good. He clearly seems to be saying in this that once that trust is broken, it fits into that category of things that, you know, keep us from ever restoring that trust between humanity and God. Think about that. If blaspheming the Holy Spirit includes denying God's grace in our midst, folks, we're all in trouble. I'd be willing to bet each and every one of us has denied that at least once or twice in our lives. So does that mean we are fooling ourselves by coming to church each week in hopes of living eternally in God's presence and grace? I don't think so. And here's why. The cross. As Jesus hung on the cross, he asked God to forgive those who through their ignorance, their arrogance, their self-righteousness, placed him, each in their own way, upon that cross. Forgive them, he says, for they know not what they do. And do you know what happens next? God gives humanity a second chance. All is forgiven. Our human debts are wiped away. God absolves humanity of everything all the way back to the garden. And we have been given new life in and through Jesus Christ. What we do with that life is up to us. But something else happened. Something else was revealed after the resurrection. Something that helps us look beyond.
beyond that which captures our earthly attention. We were given the Holy Spirit. Christ's own gift to us to help guide us through our lives and make better trust-sustaining choices. Will we always do so? Hmm, not hard. Yet something else we have been given. Something the people who confronted Jesus that day did not have. Is that because the Holy Spirit now dwells within each of us. We have the ability today to seek forgiveness. Even when and where we don't feel it is deserved. As one of our parish's most beloved songs reminds us. When we ask, we will receive. When we seek the things of heaven, we will find them. When we knock on the door, it will be opened. And God's grace and love will be made known. To do this, we need to look beyond those things that keep us from seeing the grace that is in front of us. The grace that surrounds us. God's grace. God's love. But seeing this grace and love is only part of what we need to do. We must also be willing to receive it. The reason Jesus says that those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness is not because God has a hard heart towards those who do. And refuses to forgive them. It is their hard heart. That keeps them. From receiving what it is. God so freely offers. To have it. We have to be willing. To receive it. And even in those times. We really don't want to. We have to be willing. To share it too. Who knows. In doing so, our trust in one another might be renewed, restored, and rebuilt, and even strengthened. Amen.